Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 606, Glasses. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. It was foggy this morning, and you know I love me some fog. It was marvelous. Cool, a little bit of a breeze, some very suspicious geese. (laughs) We had rain, and so the level of the Delaware River has risen to much more like normal. And that means that the bottom pilings of the bridge supports. Candy, you need to tell me what the names of these things are. I have no idea. They've been covered by water again. And that means that the fauna surrounding all of those things has completely changed. For example, the fish that had been jumping like crazy things are no longer jumping. Part of that, I think, is because the water is moving really fast right now. And so the number of bugs that are sitting on the water and available to be et are uh, considerably smaller. But either way, the geese are now back around the base of the bridge supports. Today, I looked over the side to say hi to the geese, (laughs) because from a distance is the best way to say hi to the geese. And they kept turning their head so that it was parallel to the ground. So one eye was staring directly up at me. It it was really funny. At first I thought, I'm just imagining that. And then I thought, no, they'll look back forward and then they'll twitch their head up again. Like, are you still there? Are you still there? Seriously, you're still there? Just, you know, keeping an eye out in case they needed to hiss and frighten me, which didn't totally happen. They are really scary animals when they are up close. They're big. But it was, it was beautiful, and the, the geese certainly seemed very happy, and some of them seemed to be flying north, which completely confounds me. I do not understand. I do not understand the mystical ways of the goose. Ah, but that's fine. Just fine. I have been listening to, watching, listening to a lot of Baumgartner Restorations videos on YouTube. If you need something to go to sleep to, (laughs) his voice is awesome. And if you're, you know, puttering around and doing things, looking up every so often and just seeing what he's doing on the screen is fascinating because he's an art restorer, conservationist. And so, you know, it's cleaning off the varnish and cleaning off the old nasty retouching that somebody did a really bad job on 150 years ago. It's all of those layers of things, but it's also things like you have to take the painting off of the stretcher bars, and then he often has to put it on a hot table where he can then cover it with a piece of plastic and put these little valves on it and suck all the air out so that you're actually pressing the painting down onto this hot metal table. What does that do? It means that if the paint were chipping or peeling, or was in in some way just not completely sound any longer, it gives you a chance to get it all to settle down and press back into the canvas so that turning the canvas over onto its face doesn't mean all of the paint's going to fall off. So there are lots of really cool and curious things that he does. And the episode called The Vow was not the most jaw-dropping restoration. Some of them are incredible. There are paintings that have come in looking like big brown blobs with some red blobs on a piece of fabric. And by the time he's done with it, it's turquoises and greens and yellows. And all of these colors have been revealed just by taking off, you know, 200 years of yiki varnish. The vow is not that amazing a restoration process, but what it is, is an episode where he goes through the articles of vows that conservationists make. It's kind of like the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. It's kind of like that, but for conserving art. And there were some really surprising ones in there. 
So I'm going to link out to the vow for you. However, one of the most interesting one is a three-parter. It's harder to find the third part because it's not called part three. It's called the epilogue. But that series is called The Italian Job. And it's fascinating because in the epilogue, you get to hear about how carbon dating actually works and how paint identification can help you narrow the amount of time that a painting could have been painted within. And heck, I'll link those three out for you as well. So those will all be in the show notes for 606. And speaking of episode 606, I know that the Craftlet site has been persnickety and wonky for about the last year. I've been working on it myself, and I finally got it to a point where I understood how the people who rebuilt the site broke it. So this Tuesday, I was able to get on a call with them and go over the details. They now understand the structure that the site needs, and they are on it. They're going to be fixing it. So we should get back to the point where I can say, go to craftlit.com slash 606, and you will, in fact, get the show notes for this episode. One can hope. Another thing that I have been remiss in sharing with you for a thousand years is something Justin's been up to. Actually, Justin is up to lots and lots of cool things in his spare time. He's written a book. Justin, you have to put a link to your book in the show notes, please. So, so Justin is up to a lot of cool things, aside from rescuing this podcast on a weekly basis. One of those things is The Goblet Wire. This is a podcast. It's, I think it's called Microfiction. Is it called Microfiction? It's, it's a running story. It's a limited running story. There are seasons. It's all about the really interesting Dungeons and Dragons game, but weirder, cooler than you might think. Anyway, I've listened to a little bit. It's worth listening to. It's written by not just Justin. There's a group of people, which I think makes it a lot of fun because you start to gradually be able to tell slight differences. I really like it. So thank you, Justin, for working on that and sharing it with us. I appreciate it. Can you link to your episodes in the show notes this week? Yee. And then there's Joan. Today we are going to do book three, chapters 13 through 15. So another three chapters. And if all goes as planned, the episode that will finish the book will be released the day I head off for Ireland, which would be awesome. So that's the plan right now. And then I'll have to take a little while to figure out our next book. I think we need to do something fun. So I have a couple of ideas, but expect at least mild humor. You know, it's hard to get something like Three Men in a Boat that is just a rollicking good time with belly laughs in it. Those are few and far between. Comedy is really hard to write. So it will be amusing is what I'm aiming for. That said, today is not so much amusing, but some of the parallels to things that you can see happening today are rather startling. In chapter 13, there's a, a lot more interaction with Joan, and I've actually given you links in the show notes out to the English transcript again, so that you can go and see how Twain is fashioning the way he is telling us the story of the trials, <laughs> the many trials and travails of Joan of Arc. Today, the <laughs> Couchant comes forward with a really ridiculous offer to Joan. And when she, of course, refuses, he's thinking it's going to make her look bad. And this is the interesting part, because it probably did make her look bad. You know, not, not everyone has all of the context for the reasons for why she is doing what she's doing, resisting their what look like generous offers. If you were innocent... Of course you would do this, is what you can kind of hear people saying in the background. That's something that I keep seeing happen in real life. And it, it functions as kind of a, an accidental straw man argument. I'll give you an example. Let's say someone who's been vaccinated and boosted gets COVID. And their response to that is, oh my gosh, vaccines are stupid. They don't work. I'm never going to get another booster and waste my time on that. They're working off of an incorrect premise and they've built their argument to fight that premise. 
in the beginning, everyone in the media made it sound like vaccines would prevent us from getting COVID, which is never true. It's really hard to get a sterilizing vaccine, a vaccine that will prevent you from actually having the disease take hold in your system. What vaccines do is they make it possible for you to get the disease, but not die from it. The number of people who are hospitalized with vaccines and boosters firmly in their system right now are few and far between. Most of the people going to the hospital, the vast majority of people who are going to the hospital are unvaccinated or didn't get boosters. So they, they got the first one, they got COVID, you know, the first course of two, got COVID, said it was stupid, didn't get their boosters, got COVID again, but worse. And now it's the fault of the vaccines. Well, the vaccine was no longer in your system. We don't know how long this stuff stays in our system, but the boosters definitely seem to be working. So anyway, that kind of straw man argument where you're, you're not actually arguing the efficacy of the vaccine based on its actual abilities and its purpose, you are arguing against what you think the vaccine should have done. That kind of argument is going to happen a lot in our first chapter today. And it's not happening in the book. It's the thing you can see happening outside of what Twain is telling us. Because what the people running the trial, Couchon and, and the rest of them, what they did was they publicized their articles against Joan. So people are going to hear, well, Joan, Joan won't swear. Joan won't submit herself to the will of the church. Um, only a guilty person would do that. Well, no, actually, Joan has said, I'm happy to submit what I've done as me, Joan, to the judgment of the church, which means really the judgment of you, you doof. But anything that I was commanded to do by God, I am not, I cannot submit to the church. God has to decide whether I did it right or not, which is kind of a sly way of saying, and y'all don't know the will of God, at least not, not like I do. But she, she never goes that far. She never puts it that way. But if you just look at the articles that they crafted against her, any one of them seems perfectly reasonable until you have the complete context. And Andrew and I have been talking about this a lot, that any time, especially these days, any time you hear something and it's too good to be true, it backs up everything you believe 100%. It's just, well, that has to be the right thing. That's confirmation bias. Take a second look. Dig a little deeper because it's probably not that cleanly 100% correct. But the inverse is true as well. Anytime you hear something that is so perfectly wrong, like, I cannot believe that that's the attack they're using. If it sounds like it's just too much, dig a little, because you may find out that the attack is not being completely upfront in its claims. I hope people on the street listening to the publicizing of the trials of Joan of Arc had the capacity to have that kind of reserve and, you know, think critically about how would this be possible that this woman, this 19-year-old woman, just got us out of the Hundred Years War and got our king to be king again? Kind of hard to square that with some of the things they're accusing her of. I don't know if they just turned their brain off and every minute's a new minute and so context and historical precedent wouldn't matter. I have no idea. But boy, chapter 13 rang all those bells for me. So your mileage may vary. You may see something completely different in that chapter and feel free to share. In chapter 14, there are some very funny Twain moments that are not Twainy. They're just clever. I don't want to spoil any of them for you. I just wanted to let you know chapter 14, you're going to, you're going to get some. There's also a term that's used, actually, it's used a lot in the Rivers of London books. And I had to look it up then because I'd never heard it used this way, or at least I didn't remember having heard it used this way. And that word is genius. Like, oh, Einstein, such a genius. I thought I knew what that meant. Uh, <laughs> so today I went to the OED 
And I found that the very first definition of genius, according to the OED, is with reference to classical pagan belief, the tutelary god or attendant spirit allotted to every person at birth to govern his or her fortunes and determine personal character, and finally to conduct him or her out of the world. Kind of a guardian spirit. An obsolete reference is a person's appetite, which I find kind of boggling. A second definition, either of two mutually opposed spirits imagined as occupying a person throughout his or her life and exerting either a good or bad influence, like evil genius. Number three, any supernatural being or spirit. It's also in, in later use. It comes out as genie because the plural of genius is genii, G-E-N-I-I. -I. So that wound up transmuting itself into genie. But then four, the fourth definition of many, I have to say, we're not going to go through all of them. The fourth definition, chiefly used with of, which is the way you are going to hear it, a quasi-mythological personification of something immaterial, like a virtue, a custom, an institution, especially as portrayed in painting or sculpture, also a person or animal that embodies some specific abstract idea. And it's considered rare usage today. And you will hear it used as this, the genius of fidelity. You know who it's referring to. So if Joan is called the genius of fidelity, she is someone who embodies the pure quality of fidelity. So now you know. Chapter 15 also starts with a joke. It's a story joke, so it takes a little while to get to the punchline. The punchline comes from Joan. Joan makes a funny. Joan made several funnies throughout the trial. I think people were entertained from time to time, not because they were watching somebody get railroaded and treated horribly, but just because Joan was kind of bemused at different points by how stupid these guys were. And there were so many of them being doofs together. So with that, I am going to tee up chapters 13, 14, and 15 of book three of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Volume 2, Book 3, Chapter 13, The Third Trial Fails. So the second trial in the prison was over. Over and no definite result. The character of it I have described to you. It was baser in one particular than the previous one, for this time the charges had not been communicated to Joan. Therefore she had been obliged to fight in the dark. There was no opportunity to do any thinking beforehand. There was no foreseeing what traps might be set, and no way to prepare for them. Truly it was a shabby advantage to take of a girl situated as this one was. One day, during the course of it, an able lawyer of Normandy, Maître Loer, happened to be in Rouen, and I will give you his opinion of that trial, so that you may see that I have been honest with you and that my partisanship has not made me deceive you as to its unfair and illegal character. Cochon showed Loyer the procès, and asked his opinion about the trial. Now, this was the opinion which he gave to Cochon. He said that the whole thing was null and void, for these reasons. One, because the trial was secret, and full freedom of speech and action on the part of those present not possible. Two, because the trial touched the honor of the King of France, yet he was not summoned to defend himself, nor any one appointed to represent him. 3. Because the charges against the prisoner were not communicated to her. 4. Because the accused, although young and simple, had been forced to defend her cause without help of counsel, notwithstanding she had so much at stake. Did that please Bishop Cochon? It did not. He burst out upon Loyer, with the most savage cursings, and swore he would have him drowned. Loyer escaped from Rouen and got out of France with all speed, and so saved his life. Well, as I have said, the second trial was over without definite result, but Cochon did not give up. He could trump up another. 
and still another and another if necessary. He had the half-promise of an enormous prize, the archbishopric of Rouen, if he should succeed in burning the body and damning to hell the soul of this young girl, who had never done him any harm, and such a prize as that to a man like the bishop of Beauvais was worth the burning and damning of fifty harmless girls, let alone one. So he set to work again, straight off next day, and with high confidence, too, intimating with brutal cheerfulness that he should succeed this time. It took him and the other scavengers nine days to dig matter enough out of Joan's testimony and their own inventions to build up the new mass of charges, and it was a formidable mass indeed, for it numbered sixty-six articles. This huge document was carried to the castle the next day, March 27th, and there, before a dozen carefully selected judges, the new trial was begun. Opinions were taken, and the tribunal decided that Joan should hear the articles read this time. Maybe that was on account of Loyer's remark upon that head, or maybe it was hoped that the reading would kill the prisoner with fatigue, for as it turned out, this reading occupied several days. It was also decided that Joan should be required to answer squarely to every article, and that if she refused, she should be considered convicted. You see, Cochon was managing to narrow her chances more and more all the time. He was drawing the toils closer and closer. Joan was brought in, and the Bishop of Beauvais opened with a speech to her which ought to have made even himself blush, so laden it was with hypocrisy and lies. He said that this court was composed of holy and pious churchmen whose hearts were full of benevolence and compassion toward her, and that they had no wish to hurt her body, but only a desire to instruct her and lead her into the way of truth and salvation. Why, this man was born a devil. Now think of his describing himself and those hardened slaves of his in such language as that. And yet, worse was to come. For now, having in mind another of Loyer's hints, he had the cold effrontery to make to Joan a proposition which, I think, will surprise you when you hear it. He said that this court, recognizing her untaught estate and her inability to deal with the complex and difficult matters which were about to be considered, had determined, out of their pity and their mercifulness, to allow her to choose one or more persons out of their own number to help her with counsel and advice. Think of that! A court made up of Loiseleur and his breed of reptiles. It was granting leave to a lamb to ask help of a wolf. Joan looked up to see if he was serious, and perceiving that he was at least pretending to be, she declined, of course. The bishop was not expecting any other reply. He had made a show of fairness, and could have it entered on the minutes, therefore he was satisfied. Then he commanded Joan to answer straightly to every accusation, and threatened to cut her off from the church if she failed to do that, or delayed her answers beyond a given length of time. Yes, he was narrowing her chances down, step by step. Thomas de Courcel began the reading of that interminable document, article by article. Joan answered to each article in its turn sometimes merely denying its truth, sometimes by saying her answer would be found in the records of the previous trials. What a strange document that was, and what an exhibition and exposure of the heart of man, the one creature authorized to boast that he is made in the image of God. To know Joan of Arc was to know one who was wholly noble, pure, truthful, brave, compassionate, generous, pious, unselfish, modest, blameless as the very flowers in the fields, a nature fine and beautiful, a character supremely great. To know her from that document would be to know her as the exact reverse of all that. Nothing that she was appears in it. Everything that she was not appears there in detail. Consider some of the things it charges against her, and remember who it is it is speaking of. It calls her a sorceress, a false prophet, an invoker and companion of evil spirits, a dealer in magic, a person ignorant of the Catholic faith, a schismatic. She is sacrilegious, an idolater, an apostate, a blasphemer of God and his saints, scandalous, seditious, a disturber of the peace. She incites men to war, and to the spilling of human blood. She discards the decencies and proprieties of her sex, irreverently assuming the dress of a man and the vocation of a soldier. 
she beguiles both princes and people she usurps divine honors and has caused herself to be adored and venerated offering her hands and her vestments to be kissed there it is every fact of her life distorted perverted reversed as a child she had loved the fairies she had spoken a pitying word for them when they were banished from their home she had played under their tree and around their fountain hence she was a comrade of evil spirits she had lifted france out of the mud and moved her to strike for freedom and led her to victory after victory hence she was the disturber of the peace as indeed she was and a provoker of war as indeed she was again and france will be proud of it and grateful for it for many a century to come and she had been adored as if she could help that poor thing or was in any way to blame for it the cowed veteran and the wavering recruit had drunk the spirit of war from her eyes and touched her sword with theirs and moved forward invincible hence she was a sorceress and so the document went on detail by detail turning these waters of life to poison this gold to dross these proofs of a noble and beautiful life to evidence of a foul and odious one of course the sixty-six articles were just a rehash of the things which had come up in the course of the previous trials so i will touch upon this new trial but lightly in fact joan went but little into detail herself usually merely saying that is not true passe outre or i have answered that before let the clerk read it in his record or saying some other brief thing she refused to have her mission examined and tried by the earthly church the refusal was taken note of she denied the accusation of idolatry and that she had sought men's homage she said if any kissed my hands and my vestments it was not by my desire and i did what i could to prevent it she had the pluck to say to that deadly tribunal that she did not know the fairies to be evil beings she knew it was a perilous thing to say but it was not in her nature to speak anything but the truth when she spoke at all danger had no weight with her in such things note was taken of her remark she refused as always before when asked if she would put off the male attire if she were given permission to commune and she added this when one receives the sacrament the manner of his dress is a small thing and of no value in the eyes of our lord she was charged with being so stubborn in clinging to her male dress that she would not lay it off even to get the blessed privileges of hearing mass she spoke out with spirit and said i would rather die than be untrue to my oath to god she was reproached with doing man's work in the wars and thus deserting the industries proper to her sex she answered with some little touch of soldierly disdain as to the matter of women's work there's plenty to do it it was always a comfort to me to see the soldier spirit crop up in her while that remained in her she would be joan of arc and able to look trouble and fate in the face it appears that this mission of yours which you claim you had from god was to make war and pour out human blood joan replied quite simply contenting herself with explaining that war was not her first move but her second to begin with i demanded that peace should be made if it was refused then i would fight the judge mixed the burgundians and the english together in speaking of the enemy which joan had come to make war upon but she showed that she made a distinction between them by act and word the burgundians being frenchmen and therefore entitled to less brusque treatment than the english she said as to the duke of burgundy i required of him both by letters and by his ambassadors that he make peace with the king as to the english the only peace for them was that they leave the country and go home then she said that even with the english she had shown a pacific disposition since she had warned them away by proclamation before attacking them if they had listened to me said she they would have done wisely at this point she uttered her prophecy again saying with emphasis before seven years they will see it themselves then they presently began to pester her again about her male costume and tried to persuade her to voluntarily promise to discard it i was never deep so i think it no wonder that i was puzzled by their persistency in what seemed a thing of no consequence and could not make out what their reason could be but we all know now we all know now that it was another of their treacherous projects 
Yes, if they could but succeed in getting her to formally discard it, they could play a game upon her which would quickly destroy her. So they kept at their evil work until at last she broke out and said, Peace! Without the permission of God I will not lay it off, though you cut off my head. At one point she corrected the procès verbal, saying, It makes me say that everything which I have done was done by the counsel of our Lord. I did not say that. I said, All which I have well done. Doubt was cast upon the authenticity of her mission because of the ignorance and simplicity of the messenger chosen. Joan smiled at that. She could have reminded these people that our Lord, who is no respecter of persons, had chosen the lowly for his high purposes even oftener than he had chosen bishops and cardinals. But she phrased her rebuke in simpler terms. It is the prerogative of our Lord to choose his instruments where he will. She was asked what form of prayer she used in invoking counsel from on high. She said the form was brief and simple. Then she lifted her pallid face and repeated it, clasping her chained hands. Most dear Lord, in honor of your holy passion I beseech you, if you love me, that you will reveal to me what I am to answer to these churchmen. As concerns my dress, I know by what command I have put it on, but I know not in what manner I am to lay it off. I pray you tell me what to do. She was charged with having dared against the precepts of God and his saints to assume empire over men and make herself commander-in-chief. That touched the soldier in her. She had a deep reverence for priests, but the soldier in her had but small reverence for a priest's opinions about war. So in her answer to this charge, she did not condescend to go into any explanations or excuses, but delivered herself with bland indifference and military brevity. If I was commander-in-chief, it was to thrash the English. Death was staring her in the face here all the time, but no matter. She dearly loved to make these English-hearted Frenchmen squirm, and whenever they gave her an opening, she was prompt to jab her sting into it. She got great refreshment out of these little episodes. Her days were a desert. These were the oases in it. Her being in the wars with men was charged against her as an indelicacy. She said, I had a woman with me when I could, in towns and lodgings. In the field I always slept in my armor. That she and her family had been ennobled by the king was charged against her as evidence that the source of her deeds were sordid self-seeking. She answered that she had not asked this grace of the king. It was his own act. This third trial was ended at last, and once again there was no definite result. Possibly a fourth trial might succeed in defeating this apparently unconquerable girl. So the malignant bishop set himself to work to plan it. He appointed a commission to reduce the substance of the sixty-six articles to twelve compact lies as a basis for the new attempt. This was done. It took several days. Meantime Cochon went to Joan's cell one day with Monchon and two of the judges, Isambard de la Pierre and Martin Ladvenu, to see if he could not manage somehow to beguile Joan into submitting her mission to the examination and decision of the church militant, that is to say, to that part of the church militant which was represented by himself and his creatures. Joan once more positively refused. Isambard de la Pierre had a heart in his body, and so he pitied this persecuted poor girl that he ventured to do a very daring thing, for he asked her if she would be willing to have her case go before the Council of Basel, and said it contained as many priests of her party as of the English party. Joan cried out that she would gladly go before so fairly constructed a tribunal as that, but before Isambard could say another word, Cochon turned savagely upon him and exclaimed, "'Shut up! In the devil's name!' Then Monchon ventured to do a brave thing, too, though he did it in great fear for his life. He asked Cochon if he should enter Joan's submission to the Council of Basel upon the minutes. "'No, it is not necessary.' "'Ah,' said poor Joan, reproachfully, "'you set down everything that is against me, but you will not set down what is for me.' It was piteous. It would have touched the heart of a brute. But Cochon was more than that. End of chapter 13 Book 3 Chapter 14 Joan Struggles with Her Twelve Lies We were now in the first days of April, 
Joan was ill. She had fallen ill the twenty-ninth of March, the day after the close of the third trial, and was growing worse when the scene which I have just described occurred in her cell. It was just like Cochon to go there and try to get some advantage out of her weakened state. Let us note some of the particulars in the new indictment, the twelve lies. Part of the first one says Joan asserts that she has found her salvation. She never said anything of the kind. It also says she refuses to submit herself to the church. Not true. She was willing to submit all her acts to this Rouen tribunal except those done by the command of God in fulfillment of her mission, those she reserved for the judgment of God. She refused to recognize Cochon and his serfs as the church, but was willing to go before the Pope or the Council of Basel. A clause of another of the twelve says she admits having threatened with death those who would not obey her. Distinctly false. Another clause says she declares that all she has done has been done by command of God. What she really said was all that she had done well, a correction made by herself as you have already seen. Another of the twelve says she claims that she has never committed any sin. She never made any such claim. Another makes the wearing of the male dress a sin. If it was, she had high Catholic authority for committing it, that of the Archbishop of Rheims and the Tribunal of Poitiers. The tenth article was resentful against her for pretending that St. Catherine and St. Marguerite spoke French and not English, and were French in their politics. The twelve were to be submitted first to the learned doctors of theology of the University of Paris for approval. They were copied out and ready by the night of April 4th. Then Marchand did another bold thing. He wrote in the margin that many of the twelve put statements in Joan's mouth which were the exact opposite of what she had said. That fact would not be considered important by the University of Paris, and would not influence its decision or stir its humanity, in case it had any, which it hadn't when acting in a political capacity, as at present. But it was a brave thing for that good Monchon to do all the same. The twelve were sent to Paris next day, April 5th. That afternoon there was a great tumult in Rouen, and excited crowds were flocking through all the chief streets, chattering and seeking for news. For a report had gone abroad that Joan of Arc was sick until death. In truth, these long seances had worn her out, and she was ill indeed. The heads of the English party were in a state of consternation for if Joan should die uncondemned by the church and go to the grave unsmirched, the pity and the love of the people would turn her wrongs and sufferings and death into a holy martyrdom, and she would be even a mightier power in France dead than she had been when alive. The Earl of Warwick and the English Cardinal Winchester hurried to the castle and sent messengers flying for physicians. Warwick was a hard man, a rude, coarse man, a man without compassion. There lay the sick girl stretched in her chains in her iron cage, not an object to move man to ungentle speech, one would think. Yet Warwick spoke right out in her hearing, and said to the physicians, "'Mind you take good care of her. The King of England has no mind to have her die a natural death. She is dear to him, for he bought her dear, and he does not want her to die, save at the stake. Now then, mind you cure her.' The doctors asked Joan what had made her ill. She said the Bishop of Beauvais had sent her a fish, and she thought it was that. Then Jean d'Estivet burst out on her and called her names and abused her. He understood Joan to be charging the bishop with poisoning her, you see, and that was not pleasing to him, for he was one of Cochon's most loving and conscienceless slaves, and it outraged him to have Joan injure his master in the eyes of these great English chiefs, these being men who could ruin Cochon, and would promptly do it if they got the conviction that he was capable of saving Joan from the stake by poisoning her, and thus cheating the English out of all the real value gainable by her purchase from the Duke of Burgundy. Joan had a high fever, and the doctors proposed to bleed her. Warwick said, "'Be careful about that. She is smart and is capable of killing herself.' He meant that to escape the stake she might undo the bandage and let herself bleed to death. But the doctors bled her anyway, and then she was better. Not for long, though. Jean d'Estivet could not hold still. He was so worried and angry about the suspicion of poisoning which Joan had hinted at. So he came back in the evening and stormed at her till he brought the fever all back again. When Warwick heard of this, he was in a fine temper, you may be sure. 
for here was his prey threatening to escape again, and all through the overzeal of this meddling fool. Warwick gave Destive a quite admirable cursing, admirable as to strength, I mean, for it was said by persons of culture that the art of it was not good, and after that the meddler kept still. Joan remained ill more than two weeks. Then she grew better. She was still very weak, but she could bear a little persecution now without much danger to her life. It seemed to Cochon a good time to furnish it. So he called together some of his doctors of theology and went to her dungeon. Manchon and I went along to keep the record, that is, to set down what might be useful to Cochon, and leave out the rest. The sight of Joan gave me a shock. Why, she was but a shadow. It was difficult for me to realize that this frail little creature, with a sad face and drooping form, was the same Joan of Arc that I had so often seen, all fire and enthusiasm, charging through a hail of death and the lightning and thunder of the guns at the head of her battalions. It wrung my heart to see her looking like this. But Cochon was not touched. He made another of those conscienceless speeches of his, all dripping with hypocrisy and guile. He told Joan that among her answers had been some which had seemed to endanger religion, and as she was ignorant and without knowledge of the scriptures, he had brought some good and wise men to instruct her, if she desired it. Said he, We are churchmen, and disposed by our good will as well as by our vocation to procure for you the salvation of your soul and your body in every way in our power, just as we would do the like for our nearest kin or for ourselves. In this we but follow the example of Holy Church, who never closes the refuge of her bosom against any that are willing to return. Joan thanked him for these sayings, and said, I seem to be in danger of death from this malady. If it be the pleasure of God that I die here, I beg that I may be heard in confession, and also receive my Saviour, and that I may be buried in consecrated ground. Cochon thought he saw his opportunity at last. This weakened body had the fear of an unblessed death before it, and the pains of hell to follow. This stubborn spirit would surrender now, so he spoke out and said, "'Then if you want the sacraments, you must do as all good Catholics do, and submit to the Church.' He was eager for her answer, but when it came there was no surrender in it. She still stood to her guns. She turned her head away and said wearily, "'I have nothing more to say.' Cochon's temper was stirred, and he raised his voice threateningly, and said that the more she was in danger of death, the more she ought to amend her life, and again he refused the things she begged for unless she would submit to the church. Joan said, "'If I die in this prison, I beg you to have me buried in holy ground. If you will not, I cast myself upon my Saviour. There was some more conversation of the like sort, then Cochon demanded again, and imperiously, that she submit herself and all her deeds to the church. His threatening and storming went for nothing. That body was weak, but the spirit in it was the spirit of Joan of Arc, and out of that came the steadfast answer which these people were already so familiar with and detested so sincerely. Let come what may. I will neither do nor say any otherwise than I have said already in your tribunals. Then the good theologians took turn about and worried her with reasonings and arguments and scriptures, and always they held the lure of the sacraments before her famishing soul, and tried to bribe her with them to surrender her mission to the church's judgment, that is, to their judgment, as if they were the church. But it availed nothing. I could have told them that beforehand, if they had asked me. But they never asked me anything. I was too humble a creature for their notice. Then the interview closed with a threat a threat of fearful import, a threat calculated to make a Catholic Christian feel as if the ground were sinking from under him. The Church calls upon you to submit. Disobey, and she will abandon you as if you were a pagan. Think of being abandoned by the Church, that august power in whose hands is lodged the fate of the human race, whose scepter stretches beyond the furthest constellation that twinkles in the sky, whose authority is over millions that live and over the billions that wait trembling in purgatory for ransom or doom, whose smile opens the gates of heaven to you, whose frown delivers you to the fires of everlasting hell, a power whose dominion overshadows and belittles the pomps and shows of a village. To be abandoned by one's king 
yes that is death and death is much but to be abandoned by rome to be abandoned by the church ah death is nothing to that for that is consignment to endless life and such a life i could see the red waves tossing in that shoreless lake of fire i could see the black myriads of the damned rise out of them and struggle and sink and rise again and i knew that joan was seeing what i saw while she paused musing and i believed that she must yield now and in truth i hoped she would for these men were able to make the threat good and deliver her over to eternal suffering and i knew that it was in their nature to do it but i was foolish to think that thought and hope that hope joan of arc was not made as others are made fidelity to principle fidelity to truth fidelity to her word all these were in her bone and in her flesh they were parts of her she could not change she could not cast them out she was the very genius of fidelity she was steadfastness incarnated where she had taken her stand and planted her foot there she would abide hell itself could not move her from that place her voices had not given her permission to make the sort of submission that was required therefore she would stand fast she would wait in perfect obedience let come what might my heart was like lead in my body when i went out from that dungeon but she she was serene she was not troubled she had done what she believed to be her duty and that was sufficient the consequences were not her affair the last thing she said that time was full of this serenity full of contented repose i am a good christian born and baptized and a good christian i will die end of chapter fourteen book three chapter fifteen undaunted by threat of burning two weeks went by the second of may was come the chill was departed out of the air the wild flowers were springing in the glades and glens the birds were piping in the woods all nature was brilliant with sunshine all spirits were renewed and refreshed all hearts glad the world was alive with hope and cheer the plain beyond the sands stretched away soft and rich and green the river was limpid and lovely the leafy islands were dainty to see and flung still daintier reflections of themselves upon the shining water and from the tall bluffs above the bridge rouen was become again a delight to the eye the most exquisite and satisfying picture of a town that nestles under the arch of heaven anywhere when i say that all hearts were glad and hopeful i mean it in a general sense there were exceptions we who were the friends of joan of arc also joan of arc herself that poor girl shut up there in that frowning stretch of mighty walls and towers brooding in darkness so close to the flooding downpour of sunshine yet so impossibly far away from it so longing for any little glimpse of it yet so implacably denied it by those wolves in the black gowns who were plotting her death and the blackening of her good name cochon was ready to go with his miserable work he had a new scheme to try now he would see what persuasion could do argument eloquence poured out upon the incorrigible captive from the mouth of a trained expert that was his plan but the reading of the twelve articles to her was not a part of it no even cochon was ashamed to lay that monstrosity before her even he had a remnant of shame in him away down deep a million fathoms deep and that remnant asserted itself now and prevailed on this fair second of may then the black company gathered itself together in the spacious chamber at the end of the great hall of the castle the bishop of beauvais on his throne and sixty-two minor judges massed before him with the guards and recorders at their stations and the orator at his desk then we heard the far clank of chains and presently joan entered with her keepers and took her seat upon her isolated bench she was looking well now and most fair and beautiful after her fortnight's rest from wordy persecution she glanced about and noted the orator doubtless she divined the situation the orator had written his speech all out and had it in his hand though he held it back of him out of sight it was so thick that it resembled a book he began flowing but in the midst of a flowery period his memory failed him and he had to snatch a furtive glance at his manuscript which much injured the effect again this happened and then a third time 
the poor man's face was red with embarrassment the whole great house was pitying him which made the matter worse then joan dropped in a remark which completed the trouble she said read your book and then i will answer you why it was almost cruel the way those moldy veterans laughed and as for the orator he looked so flustered and helpless that almost anybody would have pitied him and i had difficulty to keep from doing it myself yes joan was feeling very well after her rest and the native mischief that was in her lay near the surface it did not show when she made the remark but i knew it was close in there back of the words when the orator had gotten back his composure he did a wise thing for he followed joan's advice he made no more attempts at sham impromptu oratory but read his speech straight from his book in the speech he compressed the twelve articles into six and made these his text every now and then he stopped and asked questions and joan replied the nature of the church militant was explained and once more joan was asked to submit herself to it she gave her usual answer then she was asked do you believe the church can err i believe it cannot err but for those deeds and words of mine which were done and uttered by command of god i will answer to him alone will you say that you have no judge upon earth is not our holy father the pope your judge i will say nothing about it i have a good master who is our lord and to him i will submit all then came these terrible words if you do not submit to the church you will be pronounced a heretic by these judges here present and burned at the stake ah that would have smitten you or me dead with fright but it only roused the lion heart of joan of arc and in her answer rang that martial note which had used to stir her soldiers like a bugle call i will not say otherwise than i have said already and if i saw the fire before me i would say it again it was uplifting to hear her battle voice once more and see the battle light burn in her eye many there were stirred every man that was a man was stirred whether friend or foe and manchon risked his life again good soul for he wrote in the margin of the record in good plain letters these brave words superba responsio and there they have remained these sixty years and there you may read them to this day superba responsio yes it was just that for this superb answer came from the lips of a girl of nineteen with death and hell staring her in the face of course the matter of the male attire was gone over again and as usual at wearisome length also as usual the customary bribe was offered if she would discard that dress voluntarily they would let her hear mass but she answered as she had often answered before i will go in a woman's robe to all services of the church if i may be permitted but i will resume the other dress when i return to my cell they set several traps for her in a tentative form that is to say they placed suppositious propositions before her and cunningly tried to commit her to one end of the propositions without committing themselves to the other but she always saw the game and spoiled it the trap was in this form would you be willing to do so-and-so if uh, we should give you leave her answer was always in this form or to this effect when you give me leave then you will know yes joan was at her best that second of may she had all her wits about her and they could not catch her anywhere it was a long long session and all the old ground was fought over again foot by foot and the orator expert worked all his persuasions all his eloquence but the result was the familiar one a drawn battle the sixty-two retiring upon their base the solitary enemy holding her original position within her original lines okay it feels like this is just going to keep going on and on and on right like kushan's never going to get what he's looking for so why does he keep going well chapter 15 we finally get the threat of burning which yes you would think that would just totally change anyone's attitude very quickly not joan joan's still just chill joan and she will continue to be for a good long while at least at least until the end of september as far as we're concerned but that's it that's our joan for today 
I loved, 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 loved in chapter 14 that, <laughs> that <laughs> one of the things attacking Joan was the temerity to claim that the saints were speaking French. <laughs> I'm sorry, the saints can only speak English, even if the saints are speaking to a French-speaking person. That just killed me. Truly. Fell all over myself. It's kind of like the, in American Gods, when they did the, the TV version, if Jesus is going to show up and talk to somebody in a different country where people are predominantly of a darker skin tone, why wouldn't Jesus show up looking more like that person? I don't know. It kind of makes sense if you think about it. If we want people all over the world to believe, it's very hard to create a genius uh, of something abstract like love or goodness and think of that personification as looking different than you do. At least I, I find that in my brain. I have a very hard time with that. So that killed me. Twain has called these things seances several times. I know it's a joke. It just, it's those moments when Twain chooses a word that is wrong, but he chooses it to make you roll your eyes and go, yeah, seances. Because it's like, they're doing everything but raise the dead. They're working this so hard. And John Greenman's intonation didn't indicate it was a joke, but that one guy who went into Joan's cell and was raging at her and brought her fever back up when he got kicked out, he said he, he let off with some mighty cursing, but the cursing wasn't good. And then Twain corrects himself and said, well, the art wasn't any good. He did some lousy cursing, not very creative, not particularly thoughtful, just kind of rude and meh, you could do better. <laughs> All right. So I called this episode Glasses. Why? Because Aiden wrote a song called Glasses. And I have heard Aiden play it in person Many, many times it was written for the ukulele. I did not know that Aiden had recorded it. And Aiden did. And I think it is a beautiful and quiet end to an episode. So instead of playing our normal exit music, I'm having Justin play us out on I'm Not Wearing My Glasses by Aiden Ordover. Here you go. Have a great one. Bye. I don't like wearing my glasses. Sometimes I'd rather not see Don't like the headaches in the middle of the day The hard face of reality mm -hmm. Don't want to see every detail Don't want to face every fact If it's all blurry it might not be real I live life like Schrodinger's sky. I'd rather be any, anywhere else, any, any other day. Any, anyone else, any, anyone to stay. I don't like wearing my glasses for every walk in the park. Sharp vision might be appropriate at night to eat. My lonely fear of the dark Like a refrain My pain gets better with time And I weave that melody Throughout every rhyme But it seems so peaceful When you cover your eyes So I don't wear my glasses I'd rather be any, anywhere else Any, any other day Feel any anything else, any anything but this.